is on that USB drive. So these drives are so large. It's yeah. yeah. More, I'm selling the back, so um, uh, we filled the old time machine back up. Uh -huh. You know, this big 500 gigabyte drive. So I bought a four terabyte drive for her. It's, it's wow. this big. Yeah. Okay. You know, I mean, it's yeah. it's not even as big as my wallet. It's it's amazing the density of the stores. Right oh yeah. She has half a terabyte of pictures. Oh, wow. Photos. She takes photographs of everything. Three times. She takes video? Is that what you mean? Video. <laughs> she does everything. Like videos, Whatever's so. happening in life, it's recorded in Sally's iPhone. No one's had to do a quick rundown. Uh, where is Eli and Sam? Can we do a deal? Yeah, someone said Sam. I will. Thank you. Thank you. So is she coming? <clears throat> and then, yeah. Maria, Anna, and Anna, and Steve, and so Howard was. No, I think he's nice. No, okay. All right. Then, other than someone, I will send the link to someone so she can wash it in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not that big. Today's talk is um, in comparison to last week, this is a relatively simple uh, topic. Mm -hmm. Myelin just doesn't have the complexity in terms of uh, what it does or its options, and therefore the molecular machinery is just much simpler. And um, we'll just sort of watch through this one, I think. Again, a um, fair number of pictures, but okay. Uh, here's our outline, it's uh, function structure. Uh, look a little bit at the node of Rambier. Um, we'll look at the composition. All right, uh, myelin is, the purpose of myelin is saltatory conduction or stepwise conduction. Uh, and the idea is uh, well portrayed here in this cartoon. And that is that rather than depolarizing and therefore repolarizing the entire axial lemma, the plasma membrane of the axon, you insulate uh, large segments at a time. Oh, and then, yeah. pardon? Just log in. Okay. You, ins you insulate large segments of the, um, of the nerve. These could be up to a millimeter in length and you leave only a small gap between these uh, sec uh, insulated sections. And therefore all of the ion movement uh, that's gonna occur um, between the intra and extracellular space is gonna occur here at these nodes of Rambia instead of this traveling wave. Uh, and basically what's happening is upon sodium reentry, this charge is thought to run along, it's, it's never been clear how much is extracellular and intracellular or whether it's the current sink that the two of them create. Currently, the, the best idea as of today is that the sodium here produces a depolarization of this membrane, which then pushes this to its regenerative action potential and the thing just starts again. And so it's <laughs> basically that's what's happening down the axon. Why do that? Um, because the combination of speed and efficiency is incredible, okay? So look at some of these things. Uh, um, you have, uh, like I said, much faster and more efficient. So a smaller diameter axon is needed for the same speed. So we are in the, think about the central nervous system for a second. Think about the 100 billion neurons that we talk about having to communicate with one another inside the closed box that's less than one and a half liters, okay? and you're trying to pack in 100 billion neurons, okay? You can't be having these big, fat, thick trunks. So look at this, the, a 12 micron myelinated frog axon has the same speed as a 500 micron diameter unmyelinated squid axon, okay? 12 versus 500, but because this is a diameter, the volume is reduced 1500 fold. Okay, more than three orders of magnitude uh, reduction in the volume occupied by this axon. 
If you wanted to turn it around the other way and look at the energy consumption, and remember the whole development of the drain requires um, uh, the evolution of methods to gain greater energy efficiency, reduce the heat that's generated, that sort of thing. Um, you use 5,000 times more energy, 5,000 times more energy in an unmyelinated axon, okay? So, so this is about speed and energy efficiency is what's going on. Now, in terms of its ultrastructure, um, when you look here, this is a 350,000 uh, magnification of myelin. <clears throat> this is compact myelin, and we'll get into that. And what you can see is you have a classically a denser interperiod line and a, um, a, a what's called the dense interperiod line and the, just an interperiod line. And this line here, as you can see, I see, and this magnification is actually a double. Right. It uh, basically, just to keep this really simple and set a simple model in your head, the dense interperiod line is the cytoplasm. That's intracellular. Okay, and the uh, interperiod lines here are the extracellular um, membranes. Now, we're going to spend a lot of time, but uh, but I'll say again. The dense line is intracellular. That's your cytoplasmic uh, space. And so here, if you look at this, which we'll be looking at several times, you can see that, of course, you have a plasma membrane and a plasma membrane. And this is the, this is the cytoplasm. It's filled with myelin basic protein is basically what it is. And we'll look at that um, in a little bit. Um, and it, it pulls the two plasma membranes of the cell in tight opposition to one another. And then a little bit looser than that is the extracellular space. And so this is the cell membrane, cell membrane. This is the next layer of cell membrane, cell membrane. This is intracellular, this is extracellular. <clears throat> and, and that's how it shows up on uh, EM. So the, uh, the proteins are the densest material, electron dense material, uh, and then water and lipid are much less, and that's what gives rise to these lines. Um, we can stop anytime. If you have any questions, like I said, this is a waltz compared to last week. So we're, I'm just taking our time. When you look at the whole thing, um, you're gonna have this repeating structure, which again here is cell membrane, cell membrane, intracellular, cell membrane, cell membrane, this is extracellular with water in it. And the water is, I like this picture because if you think for a second about uh, what we call vasogenic edema, so vasogenic edema is the movement of water uh, across white matter, okay? And it follows the white matter. It, water will not migrate this way, you may remember that the plasma membranes are very uh, resistant to any movement across them, but the water has no problem traveling in the extracellular space this way, okay? And we'll be looking at each of these proteins which are in place uh, to uh, perform each of the various functions. And then in addition to this repeating structure, we have to look at the, the relationship of this innermost um, uh, plasma membrane here of the glial cell, either the Schwann cell or the oligo, and the neuronal axolemma or plasma membrane of the, uh, of the, of the uh, axon. Different set of proteins are gonna hold this together than hold this compact system together. Um, speaking of uh, Schwann cells and oligos, then there are differences between central and peripheral myelin. Um, the CNS myelin is formed by oligodendrocytes, okay? They are more densely packed as befits the central nervous system, with more space for nerves out in your arm or belly or wherever you want than you do up in the brain. Um, and there's a specific set of proteins that are associated with CNS myelin. The peripheral nervous system myelin is made by the Schwann cell. Um, uh, the uh, oligos, one of the main difference here between Schwann and oligo is that the oligo will myelinate multiple axons. And of course, it only gives a segment that the axon may be quite long, and it just, the oligo just deals with the segments that are near it, okay? Although it may reach out to several axons simultaneously, the Schwann cell only innervates a single, or uh, invests a single axon. Also in the peripheral uh, nervous system, you have a basal lamina, which more or less you do not have in the central nervous system. You rarely have any basal lamina at all in the central nervous system. And then uh, again, a specific set of proteins. 
Um, several slides that just illustrate these things. Here's an oligo in cartoon form, uh, investing uh, several uh, central nervous system axons. And here's a Schwann cell doing a single uh, uh, piece of axon. Um, I also want to point out what I, one of the reasons that this particular picture is here, however, is because you wonder what happens to the unmyelinated axon, okay? I mean, is it just sort of floating free in the world? What's it doing here? Um, it is, that is not the case, okay? Although it is not myelinated, it is supported by the Schwann cell, but it just penetrates the Schwann cell. So this would be a good example of unmyelinated axons. These axons are actually going through Schwann cells, um, uh, but they don't form the compact myelin at all. Uh, they just live within them and are supported by them at their funky speed. I just put this slide in today. I like this slide, uh, this picture in today. So we want to look at this process of myelination, in this case, by the Schwann cell. And the question is, if you have a Schwann cell, there are two different ways that you could create this wrap. I mean, here you are densely wrapped. And here's the uh, cytoplasm of the Schwann cell. And this is an area known as the mesaxon, um, uh, which is where one where the Schwann cell is in communication with itself. So the question is, in a Schwann cell, does the nucleus migrate around and you know it just sort of wraps it that way? Or does the nucleus hold still and the leading edge of the axon and the leading edge of the Schwann cell, which is in contact with the axon, just keeps moving forward. And, and that appears to be the case, okay? So here's the beginning of a, typically in this case, uh, this is now an unmyelinated axon going through a Schwann cell, but it's going to get myelinated. And what happens, you can see, is the nucleus is holding still. And instead you have this leading edge, which then um, uh, insinuates itself basically between the um, pre-existing inner layer of the Schwann cell and right adjacent to the axolemma. And it just keeps doing that. So the lead, so the, the myelin is being created at this leading edge in contact with the axon. Yeah, so that's, I mean, exactly. That's the, the question is why does it stop? I mean, how does it decide how many layers of myelin it needs to create. I don't know, and I don't know that the answer is known, and I've, I've been thinking about that in preparation for this lecture, so I've been trying to get to that, um, and I cannot find a good answer yet. Uh, whether it is the, I, ju I just don't know, is, is my answer. I don't, I don't know yet, and I, and I don't know that the answer is known. I was surprised when I did some research that this, um, this has not, this field has not advanced, the basics of myelination has not advanced as much as I thought. I remember Shirley Podosla was a, um, she was a graduate student of Johns Hopkins. When she presented a paper at Society for Neuroscience, must have been in about 84, 85, and all of us who were in the room just sat back. She was, she'd been seven years doing her PhD and we all said it was most, one of the most brilliant presentations I've ever heard um, on any topic. And it was the, the work that she had done just took the field from knowing nothing to, to almost where we are today. And we said, are you going to finish your PhD? And she just said, I, I don't think I'm done yet. And we all thought, oh my God, you know, you, you, you've just set the field on its ear. And she wasn't ready to stop doing her PhD. She, at any rate. Um, here's an oligo, and, and the main point of this picture is that the oligo then is investing several axons adjacent to one another. Now you can tell on this one, there's no question about whether the oligo is wrapping around the, uh, the axon. It can't do that, right? If it's going to invest several, it has to use the mechanism that we just talked about here. It can't, the nucleus can't move. It's, it's topologically, it won't work. Okay, if it does, it's going to get all mucked up among because it's in contact with several axons, so that won't work. So clearly, in this case, the leading edge in contact with the um, axon is uh, is where the, the myelin is being formed, and so then you learn that both the oligo and the Schwann cell use a very similar mechanism. 
um, some uh, uh, microscopy for you. Here's a light level microscope uh, um, and here's an oligo because there's a relative size of an oligo compared to uh, the um, neuron, okay? Uh, and uh, they're complex little structures. Uh, um, these are the dendroglia, oligo dendroglia. There are not a lot of them compared to, uh, to astrocytes. And so they're oligo. There are only a few in comparison. Uh, on EM, they are always, they're easy to recognize because they're very dense in EM. I mean, here, this is an example. Here's, here might be a, an axon or, or more likely a dendrite, it looks like to me. But either way, you can see the, um, the openness of the cytoplasm. That you, the oligo, the cell body of the oligo is dense on EM. And the nucleus occupies a large part of the cell body. And uh, of course, that's what gives rise to the, quote, fried egg appearance and light microscopy of the uh, oligo. Um, again, you, you can always pick it out because it's just denser than everything else in the neuropil. Here's an example of, a, uh, of an extension uh, to myelinate. Uh, um, you can see in this, and we'll, I'm going to put up some additional. You want to put the lights out for a moment, please, just while we uh, look at a couple of, a little bit more detail. And thank you. And you can see here, um, uh, these are incompletely myelinated axons. And you can see the leading edge, uh, the area of the cytoplasm and the leading edge uh, in several of them here. And we're going to see that in a couple of better ones yet. Uh, and then they compact them in various stages of compact. Here's, here's again the leading edge. Um, this is a great example of an immature myelination right here. So if you look at that, uh, you can see how that goes. The outer portion is the portion that's beginning to compact. The inner portion has not compacted yet. Uh, what are those cells next to the axons? Are they all axons? Uh, these are... Where? Like Which the all those cells next to that this, myelin, yeah, those. yeah, these are probably, um, they could be either one. So they could, they're most likely they're unmyelinated axons, mm -hmm. most likely. Uh, they could be uh, dendrites. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think there's enough information, at least for me, to identify which is which. They call this an axon here, so unmyelinated axons. Is what and dendrites are normally not. Dendrites are never myelinated. And I appreciate the questions. It's like, it's, it's always better to, I say uh, on my word, I say, oh, I'm willing to expose my ignorance better that way. Um, again, a Mies axon right there, uh, the uh, leading edge in contact, the part where it's wrapping around itself. It's interesting. Other pretty pictures. Um, this, uh, this, this slide is here because it shows you how the molecular failures, I don't want to get into that. Um, it is useful, however, I think, to look at this where you have the oligos, which they have in this case, uh, having three segments being uh, myelinated. But what I reason that I want this picture in here is that I wouldn't want you to think that the node of Ranvier is naked. It's not, okay? It's not invested with an oligo. It's invested with an astrocyte. And that makes sense because it's the astrocyte that is, first of all, supplying energy to the central nervous system, and secondly, dealing with all the ion mess that the neurons make. So it makes sense that the node of Ranvier, where all the energy is being consumed, after all, for repolarization, and where the ion um, uh, shifts are very rapid, it makes sense to put an astro in contact uh, with the node of Ranvier. Okay, the oligo has nothing to do with that. It's not capable of dealing with that. Not what it's for. Uh, and then uh, this is just anticipating where we're going. We're going to look at these paranodes. The paranode is the non compact edge. So if you just picture this compacted edge at the, if I, I sometimes think of the myelin segment almost like a hot dog, you know, a hot dog bun, really. Okay. The hot dog's running through it, and then there's the hot dog bun, or if you want a wrap, you know, and at some level, this thing has edges to it. It's a, I mean, it's really, if you only think, if you slice it here, right, and just look at it in cross section, it looks nice and compact and easy. But at some point, it's got a end, okay? This, this thing is a segment that has, it's, 
it's a tube in a way. It is a tube that's flattened in its center and non-flattened at the edges, okay? Tube meaning here. If I were to take like a string cheese tube, right? Here, thanks. Oh, I thought you were gonna give me a napkin. Yeah, which would right. work perfectly well, all right? So, all right, all right. So, so look at this, all right? Let's just focus on this edge, okay? You see this here? This is what I wanna focus on. Now, I could take this thing, right? And, and I can compact it. Yeah, right, we'll put an X on it. All right. <laughs> right, all right. So here you go, that's myelin, but this is the paranoid, right? So if I had two of these, this, this is where the membrane reflects on itself. And it's the same segment, it's the same layer of fold, but it opens up. I'll show you pictures, it'll be easier. Thanks. Yeah, look here. So here's compact myelin, here's the node of Ron VA. This is the paranode, okay? This is not necessarily the same as this. This has just extruded everything it can, and all it wants to do is be as tight as possible, okay? This is dealing with this, <laughs> okay? Now, the sodium channels, which are gonna let the sodium in, are here, but the potassium channels, which end this signal, are not here in the node, they are in the paranode, okay? So this is a very active structure. You also can see, I think, here, that you have these philopodia, which are maintaining an active contact. Here's your real edge. This is the working edge of this compact myelin, which is investing the axon, which is running through here. And I love this picture for its neurofilaments, uh, its neurofilaments here and its microtubules. I mean, this is about as pretty a picture of the axon as I know. This is definitely one of my favorite EM pictures because it shows you compact myelin, paranoid, um, uh, Note of Ron VA and an axon traveling through. So it's a great picture. Um, this is uh, more or less what we've been through, uh, you know, why they travel down the axon. Again, we, we've already talked about it. It is, I don't think it's literally the sodium that travels down there, although it might be, but I think it's more likely the depolarization that this membrane depolarization, which is spreading in this very well insulated uh, um, plasma membrane of the axon. And it isn't gonna take a lot of ion movement to depolarize and maintain the, the transmit, maintain that depolarization because there's very little water here in this system. The, the myelin is holding tight and it's preventing anything from entering which would buffer the sodium. So the sodium, whatever sodium ions enter here, they are, I used the term naked before, they are naked. They're gonna have a water shell, okay, but they're not gonna have anything else. They're not gonna have a lot of salts to dissipate their charge. Any charge that, that accumulates along that plasma membrane is charge, okay? It's unshielded charge, and that's gonna have a very strong electrostatic influence along the plasma membrane. Okay. Now we, we return to the cytoskeleton here because the question is, okay, so now we've seen structure. Now we have to get to the molecular level now. So there's a, a transition in. And the first thing, question is, for me at least always is, how do you maintain a structure in the plasma membrane? We talked about the, we talked about it in the synapse, we talked about it in uh, cytoplasma, we talked about it in the plasma membrane. That keeps coming back is, how do you make these assemblages of membrane structures which are large and the synapse involved a thousand proteins here maybe will involve a dozen or two dozen proteins so far less but still you have to assemble this so i, I put this step by step just to give you a sense and i wouldn't want you to remember the names here but basically the schwann cell our friend the investing myelin creating schwann cell secretes a molecule called gliomedin glial cell gliomedin okay, mediator of glial cell, which binds to the extracellular side of the axon membrane. So remember, we looked at that and we said, that association to the axolemma is one of the special parts of myelin. So it does that. And what we're trying to do is we're setting up the protein structure in the node of Ron VA. That's what we want to do here. So then the gliomedin is in contact in the paranodal area, presumably. 
and the gliamide in them clusters axonal adhesion molecules, neurofacin 186. And the neurofacin 186 is linked to anchorin. Right? Now, anchorin, you may remember from our first uh, lecture on the plasma membrane and from other things, is an important part of the cytoskeleton, which links spectrum to other things. And so, okay, so anchorin, all right, so the N86 attaches to anchorin, which is in the axonal cytoplasm. So now we've just crossed the plasma membrane and the anchorin recruits sodium channels to the nodes and potassium channels to the paranodal region. And then the anchorin binds to spectrin, which now we remember spectrum from the red blood cell from Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and the spectrum interacts with the microfilamentous actin. And if there was one thing I wanted you to take away from the plasma membrane lecture, it is that the cytoskeleton, okay, that has to do with the plasma membrane are the microfilaments that are the actin microfilament. This is your subplasma membrane uh, cytoskeleton. And so there we've created a structure. And then this is a cartoon that begins to show you the accumulation of sodium and potassium, anchorin, spectrum, and everybody linked to one another uh, in the paranormal area within the axon. And here's your Schwann cell, and here's the space between them. And the Schwann cell initiates this by secreting the first molecule, which starts this structure um, at the level of the um, uh, node of Rondelet. Okay, and that's basically what's going on there. Staying at the molecular level now with uh, myelin and looking um, uh, still at its composition, if you will. Uh, myelin has about 40% water, which is still a fair amount, um, paranodal stuff, notobondia stuff. Um, um, but then comparison to gray matter, gray matter is 83% water. Okay, so it has less than, you could say it's a lot of water, but it's actually half of what the gray matter has. When you look at the solids of myelin, they also are different than the rest of the brain because it's 85% lipid and 15% protein. Although I wanna be clear, this is molar. Of course, a mole of protein might be 40,000 Daltons, a mole of phospholipid, 280, okay? So they're not the same thing. If you were to quantify and measure it by milligrams, micrograms, nanograms, whatever you want, um, you would probably still find more protein than lipid. But at a molecular, at a, at, a, um, at a molar basis, there's far more lipid than protein, which differs in the rest of the brain. Um, the, main phosphor, the main lipid that you will find in myelin that is unique is a galactosyl, so a galactoglycolipid, if you will, on the ceramide. Um, and 20% uh, of this is sulfated. What will the sulfate do when you put it on the lipid? It, it puts a huge negative charge. Okay, so then you have this huge negative charge on the, so if it's a galactol, okay, it's going to be on the inner surface, you have this massive negative charge in the plasma membrane. And why? Because the main protein inside the cell of compact myelin is myelin basic protein. So what will be the charge on myelin basic protein? Well, basic protein sort of like ammonia is basic, right? So it's gonna be a positive charge. So now you have this huge amount of negative charge in the plasma membrane and a protein, which is just, you know, uh, uh, blistering with positive charge. And guess what happens? You just compact the whole system. Okay, it just interacts. So you have this plasma membrane that's highly negatively charged and you stick between the level, levels of the plasma membrane and the cytoplasm, you just fill the, the cytoplasm with a basic protein. And it just collapses the myelin, sucks it tighter than, and just gets rid of all the water. There's no room for anything in there. Okay, and basically that's it. Um, you have a lot of cholesterol also in myelin. So uh, uh, four to three to two uh, ratio of cholesterol phospholipid. You don't have any, or you, not that you don't have any, but you have very, very little ganglioside. Ganglioside is the lipid of the synapse. Okay, so you don't have a lot of ganglioside, a little bit, a little bit. And uh, this is just uh, back to that same picture. Here's your negatively charged um, uh, plasma membrane. And here's your positive charge, myelin basic protein, 
and also in the, uh, we'll look at this in the peripheral nervous system, there are two basic proteins, myelin basic protein, which is really a family of proteins, and another pro protein called P2, all right? Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. I just want to point out uh, that when you compare human myelin to human gray matter, um, there's much more protein in the gray matter than there is in the lipid. There's much more in the, in the myelin. There's much more lipid in the myelin and uh, same sort of thing. And um, again, you have a lot of phospholipids out in the, in the white matter, far more phospholipids than you do in the brain, okay? Sorry, in the gray matter, you have more phospholipids in the gray matter. And here you have these um, higher quantities of cholesterol and of um, the, some phosphatides, galactolipids, a lot of galactolipid that you don't have in gray matter. That galactolipid is the one that gets uh, stuck with the sulfate group to make the negative charge. Uh, myelin basic protein is, uh, again, the, um, in, uh, in distinction to the synapse, this is a relatively simple protein composition. We're gonna be naming a few proteins, but that's it. A myelin basic protein and a proteolipid protein make up almost 80% of the protein, just two molecules, okay? What I think is interesting is that all central nervous system myelins across all species have the same. So this is a highly effective system. Conservation across uh, ontogeny right, means fi across phylogeny, uh, means that this was very successful and they just can't improve on it. It, it hit optimization and, and that's it. This, this is an optimized system. Cyclic AMP is an optimized system. Cyclic GMP is an optimized. Cyclic AMP appears in single cell organisms. I mean, this, is, this thing's been around as long as life has been around and we keep reusing it for different purposes, but no one tries to get rid of it. It's way too good. All right. Um, uh, phospholipoprotein uh, is a tetraspan. You're going to see this term tetraspan, meaning it goes across the plasma membrane four times. Tetraspan, that's what it means. And, and there are several, that, that seems to be a characteristic of myelin proteins. Many of them are tetraspan proteins. I don't know that that's clear as to why. They also have uh, uh, stayed stable throughout evolution. What is the earliest organism that's myelin membrane? So you I'm don't sure find it, you, you, um, almost, almost mammalian. You don't, uh, well, not no, not positive. mammalian. You certainly find it in birds and you will find it in, you will find it in lizards and okay. fibs. So you'll definitely find it. The, the, the prototype in general, okay, the prototype of the mammalian nervous system appears in amphioxus at the larval stage. Okay, nearly everything that we find in an embryo, okay, in the human embryo, is present in an organism called amphioxus mm -hmm. at the larval stage. In the adult, it goes away, but in the larva, it's present. And nearly everything, the eye, the ear, the, mm -hmm. I mean, a primitive brain, a neural tube, the notochord, it's all in amphioxus. And that's where it first appears as far as I know. Um, myelination appears relatively early, but you won't find it in the in the lobster, for instance. So you don't yeah, find it. Not the fried you, know, you, you don't. You, you. I guess vertebrate is probably the answer. It appears in vertebrate. Can you suggest like where your myelination starts and So, yeah. So. I'm not sure I heard that, but what, what myelin, what changes with myelin is, so the compact myelin that we see here in the human nervous system, that's mammalian uh, and, and, and avian, okay? The bird is a pretty sophisticated beast. Um, I think you would not find that kind of compact myelin in a, uh, yeah, right, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you won't, uh, Lakshmi was just saying in the optic nerve, you will not find compact myelin in, um, in a, a crocodile, for instance. You'll find myelinated, um, but not, not compact like we see. Crocodile, why? Crocodile needs to move pretty fast. They move, <laughs> they do, but they, they, they don't move a lot. So, I mean, they just 
burst. I mean, the I mean, a crayfish is fast, right? Go go touch a crayfish in a, in a you know, or the uh, the any of the um, what do you call them? I want to say cephalopods. The I mean, touch a squid. Watch those things go. Or the um, the cuttlefish. Who I love the cuttlefish. If you've never seen a cuttlefish, uh, did I in the and, um, I, <laughs> go, you have to see the cuttlefish in a um, in an aquarium. The or go scuba diving, uh, not scuba, but not snorkeling. You need to snorkel in the Caribbean. Um, the, um, uh, the split island, the Dominican Republic, market? and yeah. just see more cuttlefish in each month. Yeah. It's, they're gorgeous. They they just have waves. They just they're they're electric colors. I mean, atomic, you know, day glow colors in waves. They're they're unbelievably beautiful. They're just so beautiful. Anyway, uh, never mind. Um, this this picture just begins to show you the protein structure. We have myelin basic protein and the proteolytic protein, which spans the membrane on both sides. Again, it, it's tetraspan. Um, also here. Uh, you can see the um, uh, myelin uh, oligodendroglytic uh, glycoprotein and the myelin associated glycoprotein. Notice, and this is, I think, this this will tend to span the membrane. They both do, but most of MOG, okay, is myelin basic proteins here. This is the cytoplasm. This is the extracellular space. I think it is no accident that if you want to create autoimmune models or if when you know when you look at what is MS attacking, um, it isn't usually myelin basic protein that it attacks. It doesn't have a lot of access to that. It's intracellular. It's this. These extracellular proteins are what stimulate the autoimmune system, the autoimmune response in most cases. This is this um, slide has a lot of information that is uh, not really relevant to us. It has to do with treating cancer. However, I love the uh, diagram as an example of a tetraspan protein with, by the way, it's um, lipid. Uh, so these are lipoproteins and these are the lipids that are here uh, to embed it within the uh, plasma membrane. Okay. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, this again, this will be the intracellular component and this is the extracellular. And this is what you target in cancer. This is what they're targeting uh, with antibodies. <clears throat> I just felt the need to put another pretty picture up. Uh, so I just love this. This is what remind you what we're talking about. It is this structure. And again, the dense. So I hope when you see the dense line, you think about myelin basic protein and the intracellular uh, layer. And when you look in between and see this um, density in between, right? Um, you will see the extracellular component of it. All right. Leading edge, max, uh, mesaxon. This is Sri Lanka. Pardon? This is, should be Sri Lanka cells? Or? Say again. Because I feel Sri Lanka cells. Um, because I feel they have I, a thicker myelin versus yeah, some racial. Prob well, to probably. I mean, when I'm looking at this, I'm thinking probably, I don't, you know, but I'm not sure, but probably, probably Schwann. Okay, um, uh, briefly, the myelin basic protein I mentioned before is actually a family of proteins. You splice it, you post-translate it, you modify it, and you make it suitable for either the central or peripheral nervous system. As you might expect, if you throw the myelin into salt, and I mean, you know, five molar sodium chloride, Okay, and you bind to all of the sulfate groups on the plasma membrane, the myelin basic protein just falls off. And that's all there is to it. It just falls off. So if you want to study, it's an easy protein to study because you can just throw the myelin in the pot and stick it in salt and all of it falls off. There is, I think it's interesting that there's myelin basic protein messenger RNA in the myelin process. Okay. And so um, it is uh, needing to replace this. If it puts the mRNA there, it's because it's gonna have to be synthesizing it. If it's synthesizing it, then it's consuming it somehow. So um, I don't know, I don't know that whole story, but I thought that was interesting. It is what stabilizes the major dense line. We've been through this. You can uh, phosphorylate it also 
which means that you're going to give it some, it probably has some function other than just being an electrostatic uh, piece of glue. Um, I think we've seen this enough uh, to get a sense for this. Here, here's a good picture here. Here's a sulfated uh, phospholipids, negatively charged phospholipids attached to the positively charged myelin basic protein. Uh, there are other important proteins. You'll see the CNP all the time. This is two prime, three prime cyclic nucleotide rephosphatase. Okay, so uh, again, you have some active activity going on. Uh, the proteins that are able to uh, become activated. Um, what are they going to do if they're activated? They bind and unbind to the cytoskeletal system, F-actin and tubulin. Um, and, uh, you know, this is a complex interaction, which is the chicken and which is the egg, who knows? There's myelin-associated glycoprotein, uh, which is not in the dense, but in the periaxonal glial membranes. Um, it is a neural cell adhesion signaling molecule. So it is for the communication between the oligo and the axon. So uh, again, this is, uh, you could picture that if you take an antibody and bind to this kind of protein, you're gonna have trouble uh, with myelinating the axon and you might even conceivably demyelinate one that's already myelinated. Um, the presence of MAG will inhibit neurite outgrowth. That's an important question when you get to regeneration. So especially in the peripheral nervous system, it's why, why won't the central nervous system regenerate? Why, what inhibits the peripheral nervous system from regenerating better than it does? Um, the answer is that certain of these proteins which are present within myelin inhibit uh, the outgrowth of the axon. And so one of the advances that's made in, uh, in uh, rehab and regeneration is to get rid of these things, to bind them and get them out of the way, which will then facilitate the growth of the axon, you remove the inhibition. You also have then MOG, or the myelin oligodendrite glycoprotein, again, on the outside surface of the myelin sheath, exposed to autoimmune. And so it's a very common antigen in autoimmune disease. When you go to the peripheral nervous system, you, um, uh, you don't have any PLP, that's central nervous system only. That's probably, Annie or someone was asking last week about the sort of things that might appear on the boards. Um, PLP, is, so if you had myelin and it was, uh, you, there was PLP, you're in the central nervous system. You can count on it. If you don't, and instead you have what are called P0 or PMP22 or P2, then you're out in the peripheral nervous system. P0, P2, then peripheral nervous system. All right. And PMP22 is another tetraspan. You have a similar structure. You just have slightly different proteins. P2 is also a, um, a positively charged protein, a lot like myelin basic protein. You don't find that in the central nervous system. And so this is a good summary of the difference between them. Like I said, we're dealing with a, with a very small deck here in comparison to the synapse where we you know, have the synaptic vesicle coated with more proteins than we could call it. Here we're dealing with a, a very uh, simple palette. Uh, this is about as complicated as we're gonna get. Uh, you still have the MOG, we're in peripheral, you still have MOG, that will not differentiate them. Here's your myelin basic protein. This could be a P2 protein also. And I also want to point out that although this is peripheral myelin, here's a gangliocide and here's a gangliocide. So there is some gangliocide in the peripheral nervous system myelin. Very, very, very little in the central nervous system myelin. Less than a percent. Um, the, this is an active field of uh, looking at these proteins. Now that we know about these tetraspan proteins, we're beginning to find all kinds of them. They're all going to have an important function. DM20, which is important, is really just a splice variant of PLP. Um, they're important for some of the looping, some of the tight junctions. Here's, here's another thing. Once you create the node of Ranvier, when you bring all this machinery together at the node of Ranvier, and we did that by, uh, we talked about, remember the gliomid and da 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 Once you assemble this structure, um, you could actively maintain it. You could keep spending energy, money, ATP, whatever you want to think of your currency to 
sort of keep doing it and hold it there, okay? So think about it for a second. Let's, we, we, we got a tub of water and we throw a bunch of red balls on the, on the surface of the water, little red peas, right? I could do two things, okay? I could bring all that, I could pick the red ball out and, and just get red balls together. And then I could, as they diffuse away, I could keep moving the red ball back like, like a collie might do with sheep, right? Or I could do something else. I could just put a collar around the damn thing, okay? Build a corral. Okay, and just maintain the red balls and walk away from it, right? And then not let them out. So the same thing can happen here. You see this? You have these spiral and circumferential barriers, okay? So you move the sodium and potassium channels and everything else that you're going to move to the node of Ranvier. And instead of keep moving it there and tending it like a, like a collie might do, you just put a collar around it and keep them there. Don't let them out. Okay, just build a structure around the diameter of the axon at the node of Ron VA in the paranormal region, and that's the end of it. Okay, they can't cross that and they're stuck, and you have them then assembled in the node of Ron VA, and that's a lot cheaper to do it that way than it does to keep moving them in. Okay, the corral uses less energy than the collie. Okay, um, and then again, you have all these other things. Don't think of this as a, I mean, I think. The, presence of all these proteins tells you not to think of it in this simplistic term, myelin basic protein, compact myelin, no water, and then sodium potassium and the mode of um, the A. It's, it's, there's a lot more going on than that. And this is just one of the um, recently discovered myelin basic, uh, myelin tetraspan proteins is CX32. I mean, here's the bilayer, here's the intracellular, here's the extracellular, glycosylated. I mean, these, you're not, and notice it's interacting uh, with another protein here. I mean, you know, these are complex structures. They're, just, they're not synapses, but they're complex structures. And not, not simplistic, they're active. And, and they have enzymes too. Um, you have all sorts of, the G proteins are, are very prominent here. Um, and one of the phospholipids was phospholinositide. And phospholinositide is usually present, if you remember that from our first talk on, on the lipid bilayer, I and mean, then this was not charged, right? This was an inositol. And as we're going to see in, when we get to the pharmacology very shortly, um, you clip off this inositide and make a, so phospholinositol, and that is an incredibly active signaling molecule at the plasma membrane level. That's going to set off, that's going to interact with the protein kinases of the, of the cell membrane and really initiate a lot of cascades. So the PI is a very important molecule. And you find that if that lipid is present, then there's gonna be a lot of signaling in that direction. Carbonic anhydrase for acidification, that sort of thing. You do find neurotransmitter receptors and especially of the type that are associated with G proteins, okay? So you're gonna find all that in the axon. This is not in the synapse. So you have receptors, neurotransmitter receptors along the axon, it's not just it's, that's, it's not that simple, okay? Um, and um, proteins for stability and that sort of thing. So that's basically it, okay? It's a, it's a myelin oligo specific protein. Sig excuse me, signaling protein. Okay, it's a signaling protein. Um, this was just a, like everything else that we do, it's just an introduction. You could take any one of these topics. You could do a whole course. I mean, a whole semester long course on myelin if you want to. Yeah. 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 Right. And the PM22 in the mall. So, kind of gives you an idea because I mean, when you start at PGA2, you just start mugging them and not really knowing what they are. And that kind of explains why the patient has those symptoms and what they are and where they are located. Because in MS, you also, when you work up for MS, you look for myelin based support in someone you have optic neuritis, you also look for all this MOG and also GQ1B. We also check it for. Um, so I think with this lecture, and, and we're done, but with this lecture, we end a 
large section of this course, okay? We are done with macromolecular neurochemistry that is on the border zone of electron microscopy of cell structure, okay? And um, starting with the next lecture and really the rest of the course, we're gonna be dealing with relatively small molecules. We will look at energy, we will look at ammonia, nitrogen handling, uh, we'll look at calcium, we'll look at a lot of signaling uh, that goes signaling mechanisms. And then of course, we'll look at the neurotransmitters themselves. So this really ends this a, a major section of the course, okay? And I hope that you, if you just in your mind review the pieces that we talked about, which were the lipid bilayer, uh, the cytoskeleton, uh, the synapse and myelin, those are your structural components of the nervous system. Okay, and, and I, that this is the interface between chemistry and histology right here. Uh, we're gonna leave that, that this is the end. Uh, and uh, from now on, we're gonna make use of this structure that we have created um, basically uh, to, um, I guess with the exception, we're gonna, we're gonna do, just to look at the whole outline, we're gonna look at intermediary metabolism next, I believe, which is just a series of two lectures one on glucose and one on ammonia, okay? Nitrogen and energy, what we're gonna be talking about. Ischemia and metabolic encephalopathies basically, but, the, but at the structural level, you're gonna be surprised at where nitrogen goes, I think. And then, um, and you may be surprised at the, um, at the energy uh, as well. Uh, there's a lot to it um, and, and it still is, a lot is not known about it. Uh, and then after that sort of brief discussion of intermediary metabolism, the rest of the course begins, which is all about signaling. And, and that is divided up into two sections, signaling mechanisms, whereby we will look at how, without regard to specific neurotransmitters, what are the options for how a neurotransmitter can activate a postsynaptic neuron? What, what are the different ways that that signaling cascade can be executed, right? And then we will look at specific neurotransmitters where their regional localization, where we find them, what type of receptors they have, what types of, of functions and, and systems of functions at the uh, macro, you know, scopic level, uh, meaning movement, sensation, hearing, and those sorts of things, where these neurotransmitters are involved, okay? That's more or less the outline for the course. So this is a great point. Okay. Mm -hmm. for, uh, so this, how, how useful is... Uh, oh, yeah.